Good afternoon. Uh, how do I go next? So uh, just to uh, set the scene about uh, who I am, we're a relatively you know, mid-sized, fairly large university based in central London. Got about 17,000 students and 8,000 staff. Um, we've got about 50,000 unique hosts across the entire network. That includes the data centers. Uh, and on a typical day, we're peaking at about 33,000 concurrent users on the wireless. Uh, we've got 200 gig links to Janet, which is the UK academic network. Uh, and we, our network is comprised of many VRFs, uh, which are carried across the network as MPLS layer 3 VPNs. Um, and then these are mapped to uh, zones on our firewall so that traffic between these VRFs crosses the firewall where we can apply policy. And uh, typically, um, uh, an average uh, part of the, uh, an average edge switch, uh, for instance, will have a, a VLAN that sits in each of a few VRFs. So we've got a VLAN for the guest network, a VLAN for the bring your own device network, a VLAN for the normal production network, and such like. So it's a zoned network of VRFs of VLANs. Um, we started the journey quite a long time ago. Um, and I've, uh, I've included this mostly uh, because it's kind of interesting in that uh, we took a very iterative approach um, and took our time, as those dates show. But uh, it was actually largely for us driven by uh, lack of support in various hardware because this was quite a long time ago. So in, back in 2003, we had a six in four tunnel and we had a test bed that was using completely separate infrastructure. This was, uh, th this was little more than testing and development. Um, and then in 2006, we actually enabled uh, all our routers for IPv6. So that is, we put point to points and loopbacks on the routers so that we could actually shift v6 across the normal network. Um, but this was still using a six in four tunnel to the internet. Uh, and we were using a separate firewall to do the v6 firewalling rather than uh, the one that was doing v4 because the v4 firewall at the time couldn't do v6. Um, this was just used for some test subnets and servers, uh, again, still experimenting. It was, uh, it was in 2010 that we got upstream native uh, v6 connectivity to Janet, uh, and that was also the time at which uh, our firewalls actually gained v6 support, so we were able to collapse the, the two firewall rule sets into a single device. Um, and then over the course of the following year, we proceeded to dual stack most of our production and bring your own device networks. Uh, and at the same time, enabled v6 support on uh, a number of our uh, uh, the, the usual kind of services that people start with, like may our MX records, our DNS servers, and such like. And then in 2011, for World v6 Day, we dual stacked the college website, um, which I, from memory, I think was a bit of a lash up on World IPv6 Day because our load balancers still didn't have v6 support at that time. But by v6 launch day a year later, we'd replaced the load balancers and we actually did it properly. Um, in 2013, our wireless net, uh, 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 we refreshed our wireless uh, hardware to something that could do v6 and we enabled v6 on the wireless. Uh, in 2015, we refreshed our load balancers again. Um, and this time round, uh, we took an opportunity here uh, we were replacing, we were migrating all the load balancing from one vendor to another, and uh, we took the opportunity to actually dual stack all of the load balancing. So um, the applications behind it are still v4 only. They don't, they, 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 we haven't had to have, we, we haven't involved the, 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 uh, the product teams too heavily. Uh, we have just put quad A's on all of their services that are load balanced. Um, we're working with them to do it, but it didn't require any work on their part. Um, and that got us a quick win in terms of v6 enabling services that would otherwise have been very difficult. Um, and then in 2020, and there's uh, some more slides about this, we actually uh, uh, v6, uh, went v6 only with a new HPC estate that we were started installing. Uh, so presently, uh, about 40, uh, th th this, this is in the last few months averaged, around 44% of our internet traffic is v6. And if you look at that on just the bring your own device network, which is essentially the wireless and the halls network where the students uh, have uh, uh, to, to do their own thing, that's about 58%. So the majority of our, of our uh, bring your own device traffic is actually V6 to the internet. 
Um, and if you look at our high energy physics department uh, over their LHC1 pairing, which is how they talk to the rest of the CERN community, uh, their, tip, uh, their over 90% of their traffic is V6. So dual stack mostly everywhere, usual suspects enabled, DNS, web, SMTP, we've got some V6 NTP servers. Quad A is on most, almost everything that's load balanced. Um, and we are, we are all Slack and RDNSS. We haven't really got any DHCP v6 to, uh, at present. Um, and the main reason for that was historical in that uh, the routers at the time couldn't do DHCP v6 uh, within VRFs. So Slack was the only option, but it's worked well for us so far and we've not really seen any need to change it. Um, we overcome the, uh, the accountability that would be some people's uh, reason for DHCP v6 by uh, caching ARP and uh, neighbor discovery tables off our routers every, uh, uh, every five minutes into a database. So that, that's how we make up for the lack of DHCP v6 logs. Um, and we attempt as best we can to mandate v6 in all tenders. Um, sometimes successfully, other times not. When there's no product, when we're tendering for something and there's literally nothing that comes in with V6 support for the thing that we're needing to buy, um, we, it poses a challenge. Uh, and uh, a bunch of our stuff is now managed over V6. We manage all the routers over IPv6. Uh, the edge switches we don't at present. So in terms of uh, what this actually means for us, uh, that's a typical day uh, a, a month or two back. Uh, you can see that, uh, that that's our that's our uh, primary Janet link over which our normal uh, kind of campus internet traffic goes, and it's pretty much half and half before v v6. Um, and this slide actually shows our uh, our second Janet link, which not in normal operation carries our uh, science DMZ, which is predominantly our high energy physics, and uh, that is cherry picked from a day about a year ago when uh, they were running full tilt and, uh, and ran 95% of, uh, 95 gigabits of V6 uh, for a couple of hours. <laughs> uh, so the HPC refresh, um, this was a multi-year program kicked off in, in 2019. Uh, to replace our HPC estate. Uh, I think off the top of my head, we're talking about 30 racks of compute. Um, and we saw it at the time as an opportunity to go V6 only, a collaboration between Networks team and our, our research computing team. Um, the architecture that we, had, uh, that we went for is a couple of spine switches, and then in each rack there is a leaf switch that is dual attached to those spine switches. Um, these are 100, uh, they're 32 port 100 gig switches with 30 servers in each rack, all 100 gig to the server, and then 200 gig uplinks to the spines. Um, and all of, uh, each one of the switches is its own AS running eBGP between each other with ECMP. Um, and we've got a separate slash 64 per rack. So each 30 servers is on a slash 64, uh, a 64 to each rack to each uh, 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 leaf. And then there's a one gig management network that is actually just a flat slash 64 that all of the uh, lights out management and PDUs and such like are connected to. Um, so we, we uh, initially adopted, uh, we, we initially deployed NAT64 and DNS64 to allow this to reach any uh, V4 resources, both outside college and elsewhere in college, because we certainly haven't got all our services V6 enabled yet. Um, and for a few weeks, that actually worked all right. Um, but it wasn't too long before we stumbled, started stumbling across things that either had V4 literals coded into them um, or, uh, or, or couldn't bind a V6 address at all, a uh, V6 socket at all. So um, we deployed CLATD um, because the HPC estate is a very well-defined and managed thing. All of those nodes are booting the same image. We, if we want CLATD on one of them, we can have it on all of them. So it was a quick fix and it solved the problems that had come up. Um, so experience of this, um, I think the, the key takeaway is that we're yet to encounter any problems that we couldn't work around. Um, there have been problems. Um, 
uh, skipping to the bottom of that, not least that uh, our experience of DHCP v6 implementations within, the, within this, this, the switches we were using and within the UEFI Pixie ROMs on the servers was a minefield, uh, iPixie as well on top of that. But we eventually managed, after a couple of days slog, to arrive at a recipe between the three different uh, aspects that, uh, that, that, that would get us what we needed. Um, I, sh I should add that, uh, of course, I said we don't run DHCP v6. That is stateless DHCP v6 just to hand out Pixie, uh, uh, point the servers where to uh, Pixie boot. Um, the, 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 uh, as a result of uh, uh, deploy go going down this v6 only route, um, this means that there's uh, a lot less NAT. Previously, we had some Linux servers that were uh, fronting the HPC estate acting as NAT gateways. Uh, they've gone. Um, the NAT64 is done on the central college firewalls instead. Um, and this has reduced a lot of the multi-homing that existed previously within the HPC estate. Um, it's no longer the case that uh, a server needs an interface on the management network, but also an interface on the uh, internal network and an interface on another network. Um, because it's all actually routed and just carried up to the firewall as, uh, as different VRFs, um, then you can have a management box that can be permitted access to, the, uh, to, to, to uh, other aspects of the network without having to sit on multiple networks uh, as layer two only. Um, and then the second thing I was going to talk about uh, is what we're doing with the campus network. So um, the legacy architecture, which is still, this is, this is what the, uh, is predominantly still in use uh, today, um, has little changed in 20 years. Um, the first two lines of that is what's changed. We, went dual, we, we introduced v6 dual stack uh, introduced, uh, using Slack, and a little later we, we added our DNS to the mix to actually uh, present uh, v6 DNS servers to things that could, uh, uh, that could uh, handle our DNSS. Um, but this is using all public IPv4. That is, uh, every host on the Edge network at present has got a public IPv4 address. Uh, we're using DHCPv4 and mostly static assignments. So machines are given their own public IP address that nothing else can use and to, that that's reserved for them when they're there. Um, no NAT at all. Um, and we register those public IP addresses in the DNS um, and our security model historically has been a ton of firewall policies that uh, you, you give a static, IP, a static public IP address to a machine and you've got a secure resource in the data center, you add it to the firewall to allow that IP address to talk to that IP address. It's, it's horrendous, um, but that's what everyone is uh, current, that, that, that is where, that, that, that's, uh, it's hard to change things that have been the status quo for so long. Um, but we are running out of a uh, public IPv4. Um, I realize we've been spoiled already, but uh, this isn't sustainable. So the new architecture that we have started deploying, we've got about 2,000 machines on this now, uh, is, again, IPv6 with NAT64 and DNS64, uh, Slack and RDNS. Uh, so sorry, uh, IPv6 with Slack and RDNSS, but we're throwing NAT64 and DNS64 into that as well. Um, we are then also, um, uh, we are retaining IPv4, but as RFC 1918 private, uh, we have got NAT44 as well, and we're using DHCP v4 to put most things onto dynamic v4 addresses. They won't get the same IP address every time they connect. Um, and as a result, those v4 addresses can't really be registered into DNS. We don't run DDNS on the network. Um, but what we are instead doing is for anything that has got stable IPv6 addresses that we can ascertain, we're putting those into the DNS instead as quad A's. Um, and then in order to provide the secure access to the data center, we are also deploying a ZTNA solution. Um, and the ZTNA solution, uh, the vision, um, is that uh, whether someone is on campus, be it on the wired or the wireless, or off campus at home on 4G in another country, they, they will get the same experience wherever they are. Um, 
and uh, and so even if uh, the, the way we're the, the way we're viewing the edge network is it's moving rapidly towards something that just gives you internet access. Our internal uh, uh, edge network doesn't look a million miles away from our guest network. It has a few things it can get to that the guest network can't, like the AD servers and things like that, that uh, you wouldn't want to put through a ZTNA solution. But essentially, anything that is more privileged will go through that. And that avoids the need for firewall rules and static IP addresses. And where all of this is going, uh, it's very much the IPv6 mostly approach. This is all the groundwork for hopefully being able to actually deny DHCP v4 leases to things that don't actually need v4. Um, the experience so far with that? Well, generally, as with the HPC, this is working fairly well, um, in as much as we haven't really taken v4 off anything yet. This is working well in as much as it's not this, this new approach, this dual stack network with both NAT64 and NAT44 coexisting, isn't breaking stuff. Um, it is avoiding us having twice as many VLANs. Um, as I said, because every one of our edge, edge switches will have a VLAN that's for guest, a VLAN that's for BYOD, a VLAN that's for prod. If we had to have a V4, a, a dual stack version and a V6 only version for each of those, that is a huge overhead in terms of uh, extra subnets and VLANs to carry on the network. So that was the main reason for us wanting to go down this route. Um, sadly, our ZTNA solution to date doesn't really support V6. It's, uh, it, can hand, it can make available V6 only resources to a machine that has V4 um, by doing NAT4.6 uh, within it. Uh, that is currently the extent of this V6 support. However, we are, we're led to believe, we're hopeful that this will come soon. Um, and so that act, the present would be a blocker to taking away V4 access from any of our managed devices on the edge network. But we hope to overcome it soon. Um, and I put on here, NAT sucks. Um, we haven't had to do it before. Um, and it's been a journey of discovery. <laughs> And uh, it's uh, um, I, I, skipping to the bottom point here. Um, a uni the, the university environment that we run, it's quite challenging. Uh, we have a bit of just about everything. Uh, we have corporate finance systems that we have to run securely in the data center. We have HPC in our data center. We have cloud. Uh, we have a guest network. We have the edge network for 10,000 or so ma managed desktop Windows machines, but we've also got Macs. We've also got Linux. We've got research going on. Uh, we've got the CERN traffic. Um, and we also have a halls network. We've got uh, 3,000 students that, we're delivering, that we are a monopoly ISP to. Um, it's not really tenable for us to deploy CPEs because no one's going to accept the extra cost of that equipment. So uh, we are left using enterprise-grade firewalls to try and provide a service that is as close as possible to what students would get in their home because when students are paying the money they are, they don't expect to come here and get a worse service in their perception than what they had at home, which means games consoles have got to work and Steam's got to work. Uh, and Skype's got to work, and all of these things that we could do without on the, on the academic network, but we can't in the halls. Um, and uh, on that point, Xboxes don't like this IPv6 mostly network. The DNS64 <coughs> messes up their NAT traversal, um, and we have had to uh, um, give Xboxes static uh, addresses and exempt them from DNS64 in order to work around that. But that is the only thing that... Uh, it has caused a problem for thus far. Um, Mac OS uh, CLAT. Um, I was intrigued by uh, Andre's presentation earlier. It passed me by that, uh, that, that they have actually ditched the Pref64 uh, requirement um, because that made it useless to us. Uh, we're not going to get Pref64 support in our routers anytime soon. Um, and Windows CLAT, well, if only it was enabled on, on non-mobile interfaces. Um, the final thing I add on that slide there is that we are working towards deploying .1x on the wired network and using docs that don't do Mac pass-through. This means that the idea of selectively disabling uh, v based on Mac uh, v4 based on MAC address is difficult to do with .1x, and .1x is done uh, on an identity basis, so it's a case of can we actually identify the device as opposed to identify the user and this kind of thing. So it'll pose some extra challenges. 
Um, this uh, slide, um, which I've titled, what if IPv6 was to, uh, IPv4 was to break? Well, that's exactly what happened. Uh, we came in one morning. Um, and the wireless network has decided it uh, overnight had uh, ceased forwarding ARP traffic. Um, it was, however, still helpfully proxying DHCP traffic. So what we had here was broken v4. Um, and uh, what you see about a third of the way up, oh, a third of the way along here, about 1025. Um, I, sorry, I should say the top graph is flows. The bottom graph is uh, bytes, uh, is throughput. And a third of the way through there is when I pulled the DHCP v4 from the network. And within 10 minutes, which given the least times we had, it removed v4 altogether from the network. And that uptick was the broken v4 becoming no v4. Um, what you then see about halfway along, about 11 o'clock, um, that was the point at which we rebooted the wireless controllers. Um, and they came back up. And the small amount of v6 traffic that you see starting there was the things that didn't respect the DHCP leases expiring and that still had broken v4. And they were able to start doing v4 again. Um, and then what you see at, the, uh, uh, at about 11.25 was the result of uh, us actually turning DHCP v4 back on. Um, but the interesting thing here is that on the top graph of flows, you see a huge, a huge uptick in the traffic. But of course, this is the result of happy eyeballs. Machine browsers are now making v4 and v6 connections. It's not actually reflected in the actual throughput in the bottom graph, um, which, we, which we thought was quite interesting. However, during that period when it was broken, there were still some things that didn't work. Um, we had someone. Cisco any connect VPN to another site, uh, another um, uh, institution that didn't work. Um, it was inform it was informative that essentially we we almost fixed the network for them by just pulling the V4 out, but not entirely. Uh, so just finally, uh, what's next for us? Um, we need to complete the transition to the new campus architecture. Um, having done that, we need to consolidate our public IPv4 space concentrating it in the areas where we intend to retain it, i.e. in the data centers predominantly. That's where, that, 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 uh, and uh, we won't be persisting with it on our edge network. Um, we hope soon to have full IPv6, uh, IPv6 support within our ZTNA platform, which will then pave the way for managed devices to not need uh, v4 on the normal network. Um, and then services that are not behind the ZTNA, things like AD servers, SCCM servers, um, antivirus update servers, the kind of things that you would want to work before the ZTNA client kicks in and someone actually logs into the machine, uh, these need v6 enabling uh, so that they are not being NAT6 forward otherwise. Um, any services that are internal to the campus and don't need to, talk, uh, don't need to be accessed from the internet, we are in the position that they could be v6 only if, if the services themselves supported it. I mean, we could just not publish the, the A records, for instance, in the DNS. Um, we, we, we should not have any clients in college that don't have working v6 by now. Uh, and if they don't, we should fix it. Uh, we need to investigate stateless DHCP v6 because if we do go v6 only, we are going to need to pixie boot machines. IPv6 in Azure. Um, Azure is our cloud platform. We're a Microsoft shop, really. Um, and Azure is where we are put, is where our, most of our uh, non SaaS cloud uh, solutions exist. Um, We've got, we've got two problems with Azure at the minute. We rely, uh, as, um, uh, as was uh, mentioned earlier, uh, the, the Azure firewall um, not supporting v6 is an issue for us. We use Azure firewall. Um, but also, we use a site-to-site -site VPN. And uh, to, last time I looked, uh, it's not possible to uh, IPv6 enable a VNet if you've got a VPN gateway in it. Um, so on two counts, we currently can't do any v6 in Azure, which means that uh, if we go v6 only anywhere in college, we're going to have to NAT 6.4 in order to uh, get things down that VPN tunnel into Azure. Um, and then we want to start weaning hosts off the IPv4 network, uh, off IPv4 altogether, and uh, go v6 wherever we can. So, uh, any questions? Very good, I can see Radek, so just have to run to you. Why are you? 
uh, Radek říct, what are you going to do with all the unused IPv4 space? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Are you making me an offer? <laughs> We, we don't have any immediate plans to uh, do anything with it, but uh, it has, of course, not crossed anyone's mind that, that, uh, that, 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 that there is a value to that. Um, and, it, you know, I mean, at least uh, for, 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 from, uh, for, for, from uh, my own viewpoint, it would be prudent to, uh, you know, if it, if it was freed up while it still had value, then it would be prudent to not actually sit on it forever. But we're, that is not the primary driver behind this. We've actually run out. Um, we, we, we can't give everything that needs V4, uh, public V4, uh, everything that needs V4, public V4 anymore. And it's more annoying to actually give some of it and not, and not other bits of it. So we're trying to go edge network, RFC 1918, data center, public. Andrzej Zalitka, um, I have a question. Uh, you said that you are blocking the DHCP based on devices that you know that support v6 only so i guess you do it by uh, inspecting the mac address of the device is that correct uh this is more i we, we haven't really done this yet um we, we, what we have is the means uh, we, we have the ready means to be able to deny dhcp leases based on mac address but equally uh, eyes on option 108 as an alternative um, we're we're yeah. still very much all uh, we're, we're still mulling over the options for how we would uh, go about withdrawing the V4. Yeah, I would just uh, I was just wondering because the thing that now mobile devices do is they do the MAC address randomization, which is basically yeah. uh, basically the same thing as the stable private IPv6 interface identifiers, but just pushed one level d uh, deeper or lower. So basically the uh, the SSID of network is hashed to provide a, a unique MAC address that is unique for that SSID. And uh, that means that probably you cannot uh, read anything from that MAC address. And uh, I'm n not sure that this would be like uh, useful. I was also looking, by the way, when I was preparing this, this uh, switch of the right meeting network, I was looking at DHCP options, if there is something that could clearly identify if the device is, uh, let's say, Apple device or uh, or if it's iPhone or Mac MacBook, and I didn't find anything. <laughs> I, I mean, just very quickly on that point, uh, um, we are fortunate in that most of the mobile devices are on the wireless, and what we what we probably will do is for the wireless because it's all centrally tunneled back to some central controllers, actually run a separate, a, a separate VLAN that we can uh, put uh, all things into by radius that is V6 only on the wireless. And we can do that based on username. So what we could do is we could, we could initially have an opt-in to get some early adopters who wants to opt-in so that all their devices all under their username don't get V4. But then we could at some point then switch that around to it be a, you have to opt back in. If you, we'll turn it off for everybody and you have to opt back in, but it will be a, if you need one device to have V4, all your devices will have V4. Okay, thank you. Excellent, fantastic. Any more questions? I think we are right on time. Thank you so much, David. It's so great to see this development. <laughs>